used for uh, helping the widows and the orphans uh, and many other causes. And it's exciting to see how God has brought us together so that we can do ministry together. So if you want to give in the back or you can go to thewaycongregation.com uh, and you can give there as well. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce my friend uh, Norm Robinson and his wife Bridget. Uh, these are some good friends of mine from uh, California. And uh, Norm has been uh, a, a mentor to me. I remember when I was teaching at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, I did this Wednesday Bible study. And um, it was funny because uh, he, he, would, he would come and he would listen and and I had just written my book, The First Six Days, and uh, he was just, he kept buying these books from me. And I'm like, what are you doing with all these? He goes, oh, I give them out. And I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, he, he believes in my thesis and everything. And later on, I discovered that he doesn't actually believe in my thesis. He's kind of an old earth guy. We'll, we'll, we'll forgive him for that. Um, and I'm like, wait a second. Why are you buying my book? He's like, well, I like you. I'm like, well, that's nice. And to me, it was such a demonstration of humility, of somebody who disagreed on kind of this perspective, but thought that we could still be brothers. We didn't have to agree on everything. And it's refreshing. It's so refreshing. And so what he's going to talk about today is that the greatest is love. And we touched on that last week as we were going through Revelation chapter 2. Jesus had this uh, this word to the church at Ephesus that hey you guys at Ephesus you know you're, you're standing up for truth you're standing against evil you're standing against bad doctrine good job you know you get some nice little gold stars way to go but I've got this one thing I've got this one thing you've left your first love and that was a very convicting message convicting for me because there's a tendency in every one of us, there's a tendency in every church you will ever go to to start getting into the traditions, and this is how we do it. And our, our way of doing things is better than that church across the street. We're better than those Catholics. We're better than the Mormons. We're better than all these other people because we do it this way. And in the, over the last two weeks, I've been told I'm going to hell by a number of people online. Uh, one guy was upset that uh, he said, you're a heretic. And I'm like, well, what did I do exactly? He said, you didn't pronounce uh, the name of Jesus right. I was like, oh. And I'm like, exactly how do, you, how do you pronounce it? And of course, we're texting, and he writes, Jesus. I'm like, okay. So what about the people that speak Spanish? He's like, well, if they want to get into heaven, they'll figure it out. They'll say it the right way. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. <laughs> So you've got people on that extreme, you've got to say Jesus and only Jesus. Then we've got this other extreme, you've got to say Yeshua or Yahusha or any other variation thereof. And if you, if you say Jesus, then you're saying, oh, Zeus. But you've got to say Yeshua or you're not going to get in. You guys, we can get so sidetracked on things that are important. Now, don't get me wrong, those are fun discussions. There's a place for those. It's interesting to look at the history and the linguistics and have a discussion. That's fine. But that we would consign somebody to hell for saying Yeshua instead of Jesus or saying Jesus instead of Yeshua? Is that what we stand for? What did Jesus say? They will know you're my disciples when you say Yeshua. No, he didn't say that, did he? They'll know you're my disciples when you speak King James English. Didn't say that either. In fact, Norm and I were reminiscing how uh, if you, sometimes in some churches, if you didn't say your prayer in King James English, God did not hear you. Oh, Lord, thank you for thy bounty. Thy goodness is so blah, blah, you know. And you start hearing these eloquent prayers because they're using the King James English. And we love King James, that's fine. But again, we're getting sidetracked from what really matters. And here's the reality, guys. The fact that you're here on a Sabbath means that you've come out of many of those traditions. All right? But we don't want to jump from the frying pan into the fire. All right? So we're here on Sabbath. 
give yourselves a thumbs up. That's great. But if we think that, well, now we've arrived because we're doing church on Sunday or on Saturday instead of Sunday. And if that's all we are about, and people are like, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. Well, I meet on Sabbath. Okay. Anything else? No, that's pretty much it. And we've missed the boat again. So we want to do these things. As I was saying last week, we want to get that bank account up to zero. We want to just get back to ground zero. Doing the things that he told us to do is what you expect of any slave or employee. It's not going above and beyond when they show up for work on time. Like, should they get a, a medal for showing up to work on time? No, like, that's just basic part of having a job. And so we want to do the things that he's told us to do, but that's just our baseline. We want to go beyond that. And so I'm delighted to have uh, Normanich come on up to have him share with us. Uh, he's going to be sharing on how the greatest is love. And it's so true. It's so important that we would remember that and practice that in all that we do. So thank you, Norm. Thank you, Bill. Last time I was here, I had a little earpiece and I could talk. <laughs> so goal is goal with the mic. And uh, at least I'm not encumbered by a cord, which that takes you how, how far back I used to go. Uh, actually, I remember one time the sound went down, but God gave me a great joy that I can project to the crowd without. And my wife says, go quieter in public, Bill, honey. That was a very interesting story uh, about Doug's uh, manuscript uh, and my supporting his, uh, his uh, writing the first six days. Actually, he gave me the galleys to read before he published. And that was in the days when he had to print them out. And he was like, wow, that's, that's going to cost something to print out. Well, here. And as I was going through it, I thought, very strong, very solid theologic text. But he had all these quotes from the early church fathers. Now, that's my field of expertise as a historian, is the early church fathers. And so he didn't give the reference. So one night I just went through it, marked every church father's yeah, exact reference. So he probably oh, said, how did you do that? Well, when you've read them, you've studied them, you sort of skim through it. Oh, yeah, here it is. And it's sort of like you do when you look for something in the Bible. But so we went through that, and I think it was about two years. We were really good friends and supporting each other in the ministry till he realized that my own personal beliefs was that, you know, this is old earth, and, you know, God works in mysterious ways, and I don't, you know, pretend to know, but it tells me it's old from, from looking at it. And um, it was a shock to him. I'm in a real shock. <laughs> and and we've, we've remained great friends ever since because I wanted to support Doug and encourage Doug. And that reminded me of when I was young, getting older now, and in the end of the last end of the Jesus Freak era, and I look back and read some of the things that, you know, I'd written, you know, we were Jesus freaks and we were young, and about our times at Calvary Chapel and how we had taken over Little Corona and we had our hippie evangelists and Chuck Smith caught him up. And uh, then, back when I well, got the Living Bible when I was 13, I'm a man, officially, got baptized. Uh, the Living Bible came out. The Living Bible came out in 1972, and it became the number one selling book in the United States. For two years running, outsold everything, fiction, nonfiction, all sales. It was the number one selling book in the United States, and I thought that was great. Because now we had a Bible we could understand. I mean, I was a fairly well-educated person. I mean... I grew up with the classics, reading Shakespeare and things like that, but still, the King James, to most people, was a mystery. I always thought that a lot of people that I revered in the ministry loved the King James because they loved to translate English to English. I actually bought a Strong's Concordance and started an Athair's Lexicon and started to learn Greek so I could understand the King James Bible. 
And I remember three years later when I was given my first official Bible study at the church to the teens and 20s, and I'm 16 years old, and I was told, you know, you're really going to need to start using the King James Bible, you know, or no one's going to take you serious. So I continued to use the Living Bible. And in homage to that, I've decided today's text will come from the New Living Translation. And I suggest that if you don't have one, you don't have to buy one. There's this thing called the computer and the internet. Go to Blue Letter Bible or many of the other plethora of sites and apps, and you can read it anytime you want. Quite often, my wife will ask me something that she doesn't understand when she's doing her Bible reading. And I try to explain to her in long, drawn out, big 25 cent words about this theology and that. And I said, Oh, just, just look it up in the living. Oh, and she reads it. I, now I understand it. So, our um, main text will be in Corinthians, but I did want to start out with John 13, 34, and 35. Doug had sort of already brought it out. That's your cue, Doug. <laughs> and basically, it's really simple. This is uh, in the Passion Week. The Lord's come to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It's, it's, uh, uh, he predicts, predicts Peter's, Peter's um, denial. And he's telling them, Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you. You should, you should love, love each, each other. other. Your, Your love, love for one, for one another, another will prove to, the, to world the world that you, that you are, are my disciples. disciples. This, this isn't, isn't really, really a new, new commandment, commandment completely. completely. This, this is Leviticus, Leviticus 19, 18, 18. 18. You shall love your neighbor. I am the Lord. And those who were here when I did my little lecture on the honor-shame dynamic in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean culture continent, Jewish culture of the first century, that uh, they tried to challenge the Lord. So it came to him, so what, what is the greatest commandment? And, so, and he told them that. And then that man wanted to, to justify himself, well, who's my neighbor? we get the parable of Good Samaritan. So we see this taught throughout Scripture. It's a good, very Torah observant, Torah uh, knowledgeable uh, group, so I thought I'd throw that out there for you, as if you didn't know already. But our main text uh, we will go to right now, before we, as we delve into the Scripture, we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12, through, um, we'll go, we'll go through, through 20. 20. Uh, uh, actually, actually, I could, I could go, go further, further back, back to 15, 15 but, but time, time is, is limited. limited. And, I, and I always, always thought, thought, and I and studied, and studied in one of the things from the time that Bridget and I, when I had my, my last official study, and uh, then we had our home study when we were married, is that um, I was on a quest for essential theology. What is essential theology? What must you know to be saved? I mean, do you need to know the nativity story, the virgin birth? It's good. It's good to know. You can spoil it at Christmas for all your friends by pointing out all the problems in the nativity scenes. But... It's not in Matthew, it's not in Mark, the earliest gospel. It's not in John, the last gospel. Paul never addresses the nativity. So is that essential? No, it's not really essential. The teachings of Christ, the moral teachings of Christ, most excellent according to our founding father Thomas Jefferson, who was an atheist. But his teachings were most excellent. Then you think, the crucifixion, that's essential. A lot of people, a lot of Jews were martyred in the crucifixion. Now, 
Can you have Christianity without crucifixion? No, not really. It's essential to know that, that he was crucified. What about the empty tomb, when they came to the empty tomb, as in the end of Mark? No, you see an empty tomb, you think, grave robbers. Don't think resurrection. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is essential to Christianity. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then we are, are not to be raised. There is no Christianity without the resurrection and belief in the resurrection. And of all the differences in all the sects that I have encountered from Appalachian snake handlers and Pentecostals to Greek Orthodox priests, they all are tied together by this one thing. They believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach, for those of you out there who prefer that. As if he doesn't know his name. If you are calling upon him with a pure heart, he knows who he is. And he knows you're addressing him. So it's not a problem. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was not thought on in the early church by all people. It was not believed upon. There are more and broader diverse sects that I have identified and scholars have identified in the first century and the second century of the Christian age than we have today. Paul had it in his own churches that he established. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But tell, but tell me, me this, this since, since we, we preach that Christ, Christ rose, rose from, from the dead, the dead why, why are some, some of you saying, saying there will be, will be no, no resurrection, resurrection of, the of the dead? For if, For if there, there is, is no resurrection of the dead, the dead then, then Christ, Christ has not, not been raised either. either. And, if and if Christ, Christ has not been raised, raised then, then all our preaching, preaching is useless. useless. And, and all, all your, your faith, faith is, is useless. useless. And, and we, we apostles, apostles would, would all be lying, lying about, about God, God, for we, we have said that God, God raised Christ, Christ from, from the, grave. the grave. But, but that, that can't, can't be true, true if, if there, there is, is no, no resurrection, resurrection of, the of the dead. dead. And if, and there, if is there is no, no resurrection, resurrection of the dead, the dead then Christ, Christ has not been raised. raised. And, if and if Christ, Christ has not been raised, raised then, then your faith is useless. And you, and you are guilty, guilty of your, of your sins. sins. In that, in that case, case, all who have died, died believing, believing Christ, Christ are, lost. are lost. And, and in, in our hope, hope in Christ, Christ is, is only, only for this, this life, life, we are, we are more, more to be pitied, pitied than, than anyone, anyone in the, in the world. world. But, but, in, in fact, fact, Christ, Christ has, has been, been raised from, from the, the dead. dead. He is, he is the, the first of the great, great harvest, harvest of all who have who died. died. I will, I will leave, leave the rest me. of the chapter for Doug on another day, because I know he's going to really enjoy that, the uh, eschatology in that. And we'll continue with how do we live out this good news in our lives, all right? The good news that Christ has been raised from the dead, you are not going to be left dead in the grave, dead in your sins, and pitiful in this world for having believed in a false Messiah. And Paul makes it very clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we will do the entire chapter. <sighs> Love, Love is, is the, greatest. the greatest. If, if I, I could speak, speak all, all the languages, languages of, the of the earth, earth and of angels, angels but didn't, didn't love, love others, I would, I would only, only be a noisy, noisy gong, gong or clanging clanging symbol. symbol. If I if had, I had the, gift the gift of prophecy, prophecy and, if, and I if I understood all of God's, God's secret, secret plans, plans and possessed, and possessed all, all knowledge, knowledge, and if, and if I, had I had such faith, faith that I could move mountains, mountains but didn't, didn't love, love one another, I would, I would be nothing. nothing. If, if I, gave I gave everything I have, I have to the poor, poor and even, even sacrifice to my body, I could, I could boast, boast about, about it, but, but if, if I didn't, I didn't love, love others, others, I would, I would have, have gained, gained nothing. nothing. Again, Again we, we can remember, remember the, the honor-shame dynamic is that everything is hubris. If you try and do it, keep this honor upon yourself. Such as Doug has honored me today by asking me to speak again after you heard me speak once. So he's really risking it, you know. That's an honor, great honor. Uh, 
My wife and I are founding members of Friends of Jewish History, Turo College Avenue J campus, and a um, friend of mine who's a good friend of mine who's a dean of academic affairs there, Dr. Henry Abramson, whose Jewish name is Hillel. Uh, we all went out to dinner, that was an honor. They took me out, and when we went to New York to visit, and I was gonna pick up the bill because the vice president of this was a little bit over his cost point. <laughs> and no, I could not pick up the check. If we are taking you to dinner, it shamed them if I would have uh, allowed me. Actually, now Henry Rubin, he's not quite so orthodox. <laughs> I think he would have gone for it. <laughs> so, but in, in that culture, if you, you hold to these things, you find that you can have all of this. If I had all of this prophecy, and we talk about having faith, how many people have ever come up to and said, I have all faith, you know? I mean, a lot of people think they have all faith, but I have not yet seen anyone move a mountain into the sea. And you just need a little mustard seed size, with a grain of faith to do that. Oh, Lord, I have faith. Give me more faith, you know? Peter. Love is patient and kind. kind. It, is it is not, not jealous, jealous or boastful, boastful or proud, or proud or rude. or rude. It does, it does not, not demand its, its own way. way. It is it not, not irritable. irritable. It, it keeps, keeps no, no record, record of being, being wrong. wrong. How much, How much easier, easier would our lives, lives be if we had no record, record of being, being wrong? wrong? You know, it's, no, it's really, really easy, easy to get resentments in this life if you don't let go of things. The Lord has taught us to love. And perfect love, when you stare into the face of this perfect law of love, it takes away all of the hurts. You just let them go. It does not, not rejoice, rejoice about, about injustice, injustice but, but rejoices, rejoices whenever, whenever the truth, truth wins, wins out. out. Love, love never, never gives, gives up, up never, never loses, loses faith, faith is, is always, always hopeful, hopeful, and endures, and endures through, through every, every circumstance. circumstance. Prophecy, Prophecy and, speaking and speaking in unknown, unknown languages, languages tongues. tongues, and special, and special knowledge, knowledge will become, become useless, useless, but, but love, love will last, last forever. forever. Now, now our, our knowledge, knowledge is partial, partial and, and incomplete. incomplete. I really, I really have known, known everything, everything since I was a teenager. That was the last time that I knew everything. The older I get, I think I must be coming senile because the less I realize I know, but I do know that if I continue to love people, encourage people, if I agree with them or not about what I call minor theologies, which is basically everything else than the life, death, and resurrection, ascension of our Lord, then I'm doing the right thing. Now our knowledge is partial and complete, and even, and even the, the gift of prophecy reveals, reveals only part, part of the whole picture. picture. But, when but when the full understanding comes, these partial, partial things, things will become useless. useless. Some, Some people, people have taught, taught that the Bible, Bible put into a codex and, and canonized was the fulfillment of this, the complete. But I do not believe that that's what Paul's referring to. It's referring to the end of the age when we are with God and we will know God as he knows us. When I was a child, I spoke and, and thought, thought and reasoned, and reasoned as, a child. as a child. But when, but when I, grew I grew up, I put, I put away, away childish, childish things. things. Now, now we, we see, see things, things imperfectly, imperfectly as in as a in cloudy, cloudy mirror. mirror. But, but then, then we will, we will see, see everything, everything with perfect, perfect clarity. clarity. And that, and that I, know I know now is, now is partial, partial and, and incomplete. incomplete. But, but then, then I will I know everything, everything completely. completely. Just, Just as God, God now knows, knows me completely. completely. Three, Three things, things will last, last forever. forever. Faith, Faith, hope, hope and, love. and love. And the and greatest, the greatest of, these of these is, is love. love. You cannot go wrong loving your neighbor. You cannot go wrong giving somebody that you see in need some help. Maybe 
you might get taken by a panhandler here and there, but you're still not going to go wrong. You can't go wrong having faith in the faithful one, even if you don't know how to properly pronounce his name in Hebrew, like me. Doug has been working with me for how many, 13 years, trying to teach me a little Hebrew? I have no gift of tongues, none. I, I, I get it about right about half the time. And then that's with some real encouragement. Uh, Greek, not home much better either, but at least I can say that was a dead language. No one really knows how to speak it. So I have heard professors in England and Oxford pronounce it one way, and I've heard them at Harvard pronounce it another way, and I've heard them at USC pronounce it a different way. So I'm safe with Greek. English, Spanish, Chinese, Portuguese, any language. God knows who he is. He knows your heart. He knows that you're addressing him from a pure heart. And it doesn't matter if you say it this way, that way, or the other way, as long as you are reverent and loving and seeking him with your pure heart, he will hear your prayer, and he will respond to your prayer. And you will know it in your heart that God has heard your prayer. It doesn't mean you're always going to get your way. God is not the God of this world. He is not Santa Claus. But he is our God, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I thank you for allowing me to be here and to speak to you today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Norm. What an encouraging word. You know, the things that he's challenged us with are not easy because we go back into our daily lives we go back into some of the pursuits that we have the discussions that we have with family and friends and it does raise a very interesting question if it's all only about love then why do we take time to get into eschatology why do we take time to uh, learn the history of the early church why do we spend all this time and energy and effort learning the ancient languages. Why do we do these things? And it, it, even for me, that's a very challenging question. And what I would suggest is that it's good to know, it's good to know history, it's good to know the culture, it's good to know the context in which these things happen. Because as we talk about love, love can be very... Uh, gooey. <laughs> it can be something that it's very different for one person than another person. And back in the 60s, it was free love, right? And uh, for others, you know, uh, the homosexual community says, well, you should just love us. You know, it's okay. Right? And so what we want to do, what, the reason that we study the Bible is to understand what is God's definition of love? Because my definition, your definition are not really important. God's definition of love is of the utmost importance. And we read in uh, 1 John that if you say that you love him, but you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar, and the truth is not in him, not in, not in you. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is the, this is the trouble, because this is kind of a a, a, a horse and cart issue. We get the, the cart before the horse so often. You see, if we love Jesus, then we're going to do the things that he's told us to do. But what happens so often is that we say, well, I'm going to do these things, and then maybe he'll love me. Or maybe I'll love him when I do these things. So, yes, we want to keep his commandments. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we want to make sure that we are doing those things out of a heart of love for the Father. If you're in a relationship, it's very similar. You don't, you know, make your husband or wife or your girlfriend or boyfriend coffee, or you don't give them nice things so that they will love you. You don't do these things hoping that maybe you'll win their favor. 
you already have their favor. They decided to spend the rest of their life with you, so you're good. So now because you're in a relationship, in a covenant relationship with this person, who's already said, I do. They were crazy enough to, to you know, say, I'll spend the rest of my life with you. Now, if you love the person, are you going to continue to do things that annoy them? Now, you just might still do some things, but you're not going to do those purposely. You know, like if your wife's pet peeve is leaving the toilet seat up, you might leave it up occasionally because you're absent-minded. But you're not going to be like, I'm going to leave this thing up just to, you know, make her mad. That wouldn't be very loving, would it? If you're husband or wife loves coffee, are you going to spike it with salt? No. Why would you do that? If you love this person, why would you do those things? You see, and that's the same thing that what we understand is that we talk about Torah, we talk about Sabbath, and, and the, the many things that we see in the Word are like, this is still for us. But the danger that we face is that we start thinking that those things are somehow the things that God's looking for. But those should be the fruit of our love for God. That should be the fruit of loving Him and walking with Him. And so we want to be careful that we don't get the horse and the cart confused. The horse is always going to lead the cart. Our love for God and His love for us is going to lead us in His commandments. And as we walk with him, we're not going to do things that will intentionally upset him when, he told, when he's told us, I don't like it when you do that. I don't like it when you offer your children to Molech and burn them. I just don't like that. I don't like it when you bear false witness. I don't like it when you murder. I don't like it when you commit adultery with your spouse. And I don't like it when you commit adultery against me. You see, because I have a heart for God, and I know that he has a heart for me, I don't want to do those things because I love him. And because I'm walking with him and I've understood the depth of his love, I want to please him. Not because I'm under some obligation, but because I have a grateful heart. And I care about him. And he cares about me. You recall in Ezekiel chapter 6, God said, I was crushed by their adulterous heart. When we go after the things that he's told us that he doesn't like, he's hurt. Yeah, God is hurt. The creator of the heavens and earth, the almighty, the omnipotent, the all-powerful, can be hurt by your actions. You know why? Because love is vulnerability. That's what it is. That's what it is. There can be no true love without the possibility of being hurt. And God was willing to make himself vulnerable when he created Adam and Eve in his image and in his likeness, and then he gave them, in, in fact, he, he, in order to really be like him, they had to make a choice. A yes or no, either, either is good. Well, one is better than the other. But both of them, either choice was necessary to be like God. You recall that after Adam had eaten, God said, hey, look, man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. That was from the bad choice. Adam could have made the right choice. But either way, God had to make himself vulnerable because he wanted creatures that would not just be robots or pets or something that he's just pre-programming it and then what you put in is what you get out. And we say, oh, I love you, Lord. And he's like, yeah, I know. I, I programmed you that way. Of course they're going to say that. He wants it to be where we can say, no, I hate you. Because if we have the ability to say, I hate you and I want nothing to do with you, when we actually turn around and say, I love you and I understand how good you are 
then it has meaning then it has value then it has value so the greatest of these is love and you know what if our God has been patient with us and he's loved us and he's forgiven us shouldn't we be patient with one another should we really blow up when somebody says something that we didn't quite like or they used the wrong buzzword or they didn't say the way the name of God the way we think it should be said shouldn't we show some compassion and patience with one another and if we are truly on a path of discovery and learning and we're walking now the way that Yeshua taught should we have patience with those who are just a couple steps behind us absolutely because there are people that are more steps ahead of us and they're being patient with us we need to be patient with each other kind with each other and we should forgive each other's sins we should forgive each other's offenses toward us that's what love is all about Jesus said they will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another that's it that's it and the world is watching they're like you know we don't want to be Christians because we see you guys and you're a bunch of hypocrites and you're just you know eating each other always throwing stones at each other we don't want to do that look I'm not telling you to not stand for truth I'm not saying that that you have to just be wishy-washy and like everything goes man that's okay you can have principles but you can have principles and still love your brother and your sister and you can even say you know what I disagree like Norm and I have times where we're like I, I just don't agree with that but I still love you because you're a good brother and I know that you're made in the image and the likeness of God and even though we disagree on this particular point it's fun, it's academic, it's, it's interesting, it stimulates your brain. And, you know, maybe he'll see the light one day. Maybe he won't, maybe I'll see the light one day, right? But you know what? Either if, even if neither of us sees the light on each other's issues, we can still love each other. And that's what we want to do, is love each other. Despite our differences, because I'll tell you what, even here at the Way Congregation, we don't all think the same. I have views that are different from your views, and you have views that are different than mine. But does that mean that I should hate you or say, oh, you're going to hell or something like that? No. Look, God will take care of the afterlife. That's his department. He gets to decide. He's the judge, not us. So our job is to love one another. And you know what? Be open. Be vulnerable to learn something new. Be vulnerable and say, wow, you know, my brother and my sister has a different perspective. Brother or sister, tell me why you think that way. Help me understand why you came to that conclusion. And maybe I'll understand and I'll agree. Or maybe I won't. Maybe we can have a good discussion. Maybe God's going to use me to help you grow. Maybe God's going to use you to help me grow. But either way, when we love each other, we grow, we learn. We have fun, we have joy. That's what we want to be about. That's what we want to do. And we're just so, so grateful for all that our Lord has given us. If you'll stand with me, I want us to finish with this most wonderful blessing. It's a good, good blessing. This is God's promise to you that he loves you, he cares about you, and he wants to bless you. Yevarecha yeva ve yishmerecha Ya e yeva panavelecha vi hudecha Yisa yeva panavelecha ve yesemlecha shalom